For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Award-winning financial journalist Neil Hubert joins me to unpack his authorized biography titled Whitey, The Rise and Rules of the Shoprite King. The book is primarily based on interviews, phone conversation, and text messages between yourself and Whitey over a period of close to three years. So how were you able to persuade Whitey that you were the right person to tell his story? And why did you want to write about the South African giant and king of retail? I met Whitey or listened to Whitey quite a few times at ShopRite's um, annual results presentations as a journalist uh, while he was still CEO of ShopRite Checkers. And he was always a colorful character. And obviously, I mean, the story of Whitey and ShopRite is a is an amazing story, what he managed to build over a period of 40 years uh, from a small eight-store retailer in, in the Cape to one of the biggest or the biggest in Africa, um, biggest in South Africa. Uh, so amazing story. And then... After the sign-off scandal or bomb dropped, Whitey was one of the few voices that spoke out against Steinhoff. Um, and I went to Tafelberg uh, Publishers and just said, why don't we do something about Whitey Basson? Um, and I flew down to meet him at his restaurant in Salambosch, Montmarie. And I think we just clicked. I mean, we, we chatted for the whole afternoon so much so that he said, yeah, let's change your flight back to the next morning. Can I have a bride at my house that evening? Which I did. I slept over at his house. Uh, we just uh, so we spoke about everything from the economy to retail, to business, to South Africa. And um, yes, and the next day we said, okay, let's do this. And, and that's how it started, yeah. And as you just mentioned that YT Person grew shop right from eight small stores into the largest retailer in Africa. Can you tell us more about how he managed to do this? First of all, he started his retail career at Pep stores. So that's basically where he learned the, the art of retail from Rainier van Roy and the founder of Pep stores. So YT as a young um, chartered accountant joined the Pep group um, and for and in his mid twenties already, he had a, a senior um, role at Pep, and um, that's where he learned his his trade in the retail. And in effect, um, Van Rooyen took a bit of a sabbatical, um, gave Whitey power of attorney, and Whitey in effect um, ran Pep for a few years. Um, that's where he learned the trade, and then uh, Renis came back and, and Whitey was up for a new challenge and then the the um, opportunity to buy these eight little stores in Cape Town um, came about, um, which he did, which he bought with the help of Pip. Um, and I think from the start, what Whitey said was he had a vision of growing the company to become the largest food retailer in South Africa. I mean, at that stage, Pick and Pay was the giant in South Africa uh, under Raymond Ackerman's leadership. Um, uh, OK was there, Checkers was there, and ShopRite was was nowhere. I mean, these small eight stores. So first of all, I think he had a vision of building this company, and he got the right people on board, um, smart people, people that was willing to work, work hard. I mean, retail is, is a difficult game. You need to to work very, very hard. Um, and that, that's what they did. But so he could sell that vision of let's take on these big guys and beat, pick and pay, basically. That was their goal. So they were all around this goal to let's grow. Let's, let's um, try and take on pick and pay and beat them. So they grew organically at the start um, out of the Western Cape to Gauteng with a focus. Um, I think what he brought in was a focus to let's, Let's, let's do what we do. Let's do that well and bring low prices to people, quality goods at low prices in clean stores, in, in nice stores where you want to go and shop. Because, um, I mean, the, the first few shop rights that he bought, um, Whitey says in the book, some of them had carpets in it. Um, yeah, so you push your trolley and the, the carpets made like these bubbles. Um, and the, it was more like a general dealer than food retailer. 
So I think brought in that focus of saying, okay, this is a shop that is going to be. Every store should look the same, same corporate colors. And then, of course, he knew that to take on pick and pay, they needed to do a few acquisitions. And that's where the acquisition spree started in the 90s. And where are the sole challenges Whitey saw opportunities? So can you tell us a bit more about his strategy? Yes, yeah, so I think Whitey was always um, an optimist um, at heart. So I think where other people saw challenges, um, he saw opportunities and he took those opportunities. Um, and like I said, I think they knew that to grow as big as they wanted and fast, they needed to do a few acquisitions. So um, in the early 90s, he bought, or if his first, you would say, big acquisition was Grand Bazaars. Turned that around, was struggling, turned that around quite quickly. Then the big one was Checkers, um, which he also bought, um, which was losing millions of rands a day, a month, um, and nobody could turn it around or, or fix it. And Whitey and his team came in and, and fixed it. And within a year, it was profitable again. I think one thing that Whitey and his team brought into Checkers and, and all the other business that they bought um, was also focused on saving costs um, to, to be thrifty, basically. Um, I, I think Whitey learned that from a young age from his father, um, and his mother there in Portable, where he grew up. Uh, yeah, in the book, he says, um, people always ask his, his dad, why don't you buy a new car, for example? And then he said, well, I've got 13 reasons. Um, the first reason is I don't have enough money for a new car, and the other 12 don't count. So he was always conscious of saving money, because every cent you can save in retail, you can pass on to the consumer and lower prices. And that was his philosophy. And, and, and the key thread is that we need to keep prices low. So if you're going to waste money, um, you can't be a, a, a low-cost retailer. So you need to cut costs. Um, so basically, when he, when he went into checkers, um, they had these opulent offices with leather chairs and, and these artworks against the wall and this dining room with waiters with the whitey tells the story waiters with suits and white gloves um and you had a five course meal and oysters and champagne and <laughs> those kind of things and he walked the the day then Joburg he walked into the guys and said you guys know the story of the last supper well, this is the last lunch. Today we're shutting down this cafeteria. Um, and tomorrow you bring in your own two uh, um for lunch. So basically cutting costs, which was a big thing, and, and getting the right people on board. Once again, that vision to to get people to to work hard. Um yeah, I think the, the other philosophy that Whitey always had, and that he, that he learned from Rainier van Rooyen at Pep, and also Barney Rogart, who started ShopRite, um, was you can't do business from the from your office. You need to be on the floor, detail-orientated, know everything that goes on, know your market, and know your competitors. I mean, Whitey did an analysis of um, Raymond Ackerman and Pick and Pay just to know what are they doing and how can we beat them and he learned a lot from Walmart for example as well so I did, once a year went over to the to, to the USA to study their retail trends um, I mean the USA is always at the forefront of, of innovation and technology and those kind of things so he always went over once a year to, to go and study what they're doing and bring some of those ideas over so yeah, um, I think that uh, that made him successful, and and then obviously after checkers he bought OK for one rand, uh, the legendary deal. And you write that another big factor in Whitey's decision to walk away from Shoprite was the pressure to merge Shoprite and stay north. Talk to us more about this merge. So Kirsten Visa, so a long time friend of of Whitey, and they met um, 
at Salem Bosch at Volkhanov when they were students. Um, and Visa was involved with Pep, uh, left to become a lawyer um, and, and came back and basically became the largest shareholder in Pep um, and consequently also in ShopRite because Pep owned ShopRite. And then, yeah, I mean, it was in the 2000s, 2010s, um, Visa met Marcus Uister, who was the CEO of Steinhoff. And they had this grand plan to consolidate all Visa's um, holdings into to Steinhoff. Um, so firstly, they did that with Pep's, um, Pep Court, uh, which was folded into Steinhoff. And Visa wanted to do the same with, with ShopRite. And YT didn't want to go for that. Um, he, he said, basically, Steinhoff and ShopRite or he thought ShopRite was a better company than Steinhoff. So why would you want to be a part of a lesser company in his view? Um, I know that he said uh, way back that to merge Steinhoff and ShopRite is like merging um, Toyota and Anglo-American, two different companies uh, that don't go well together. And once again, YT went to stores and, and looked at the stores on the floor like he always did said he doesn't think it's a good business and he did the sums i mean he said the cost of capital is higher than, than the return that they get on the equity so the deal just didn't make sense to him yeah and he and he said i'm not going to go for this and so the first try didn't go through and then um a, a bit later Visa tried again and said, okay, we're not going to do the same deal as we did with Pep, but I'm going to sell my shares together with PIC um, to Steinhoff. And in effect, Steinhoff would have gotten um, control of the shop, right? So I don't think YT, at that say he was always, um, I mean, that stage he was also um, 70 or just over 70. So, I mean, he was... Um, also a bit older now and he worked so hard during his life and he had the succession planning in place at ShopRite. So he said, okay, this is now me. I'm done. I'm not going to be a part of this deal. Um, I don't want to uh, be part of Steinhoff. And and he didn't like Marcus Uerster. <laughs> they didn't see eye to eye. They, they had different styles. Like I said, Whitey was this the retailer, cost conscious, um, not flashy. And Steinhoff and Marcus Uerster was the total opposite. They just didn't see eye to eye. So he said, okay, no, this is me. I'm going to retire. So he had to work a year uh, at Chopper for, to, to have a smooth handover. But um, he, in effect, basically saved um, ShopRite um, because, yeah, I, I think it was a, a few weeks or months after White retired, the Steinhoff bomb dropped uh, where Marcus Uster resigned and the share price just tanked. White had a yearning to produce top quality wines, a passion he could not pursue while he was at ShopRite. So tell us more about the wines he makes with the help of expect winemakers. He bought this little farm outside Salenbosch, um, Klein Dasbosch, um, so it's, it's named after the family farm in Portable, where he was born and where he grew, grew up, Dasbosch. So this is Klein Dasbosch, the one in Um, Yeah, and they, they've got a few vineyards there. So initially he brought in Jan Boulan to see her. So he's, the fam he's a famous winemaker. He was a Springbok rugby player, legendary Springbok rugby player. And um, a great winemaker close by, and he was his friends of uh, with YT. And I think since it's become um, a bigger business, they've got their own winemakers now um, on the farm. It, it's a proper business, um, yeah. And they produce um, all kinds of wine there under the label Klein Dasbosch, and then also Mont Marie. It's the farm that YT bought across from this, from them, where as a restaurant. So he dabbles a bit in winemaking. Um, I think, yeah, Whitey says with the winemaking, it's also, he was always a big proponent of um, employment and creating opportunities for people. So 
and he employs a lot of people on his farms. Um, and I think he loves seeing that, creating employment, helping with economic growth. He always wanted to build something uh, that that would outlive him and and continue. Um, and I, I think ShopRite would do that. ShopRite, I think, would, would be with us for a very long time. Such a solid, strong company. And the same with these wines. Um, it's 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 on the same concept that build this brand from from scratch. Um, yeah, so I think he's very proud of his of his wines as well. And lastly, Neil, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? Well, I think what it started out was a more of a business book, and and what Whitey did, and and the success factors, and. It, it's. I think it's more of the person behind the the CEO and the smart businessman. It's got lots of human stories in it and funny stories. Um, I mean, Whitey got a great sense of humor. I think it comes through in the book. Um, so I think it's a good read in general for anyone. Um, but also I think people can take a lot from it in terms of what made him successful, and. People now ask me, so what made Whitey successful? What made ShopRite successful? And you can't get past it. And people don't actually want to hear this usually because people want this magic bullet of what makes someone successful. And you can't get past hard work, bloody hard work. And um, I mean, Whitey worked every day, weekends, holidays, um, and his team. So it, it first of all, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't work hard. But um, I think what Matt White is so successful and Shoprite is the culture that he established there, the one of looking after the saints. Um, like he always says, um, take care of the pens and the pounds will take take care of themselves. So cutting costs. Um, Know your market, um, that the client comes first, and do your homework on your market, on your competitors, um, and, and focus on what you do well. I think Whitey's main thing also is that, uh, and they always say retail is detail, and Whitey knew the detail um, and, and did his business on the shop floor. Uh, if I can give some advice to other entrepreneurs and Whitey's advice is that you need to have your finger on the pulse of your business. Um, yeah, and then also I think be an optimist, see um, opportunities where others see challenges. I think that was one of Whitey's main things. That was Neil Yubert speaking to Krima Media's Polity about Whitey, the rise and rules of the ShopRite King.